Hello and welcome to today's panel discussion. This is a discussion which is hosted by the Hellenic Observatory here at the LSE, and I'm very pleased to be the director of the observatory. What is the relationship between religion and human rights in Greece? Greece has had one of the highest number of violations in this area as judged by the European Court of Human Rights. We will explore the controversies that have arisen and seek to explain their context. This is an area where explanation, effective explanation, veers beyond interpretation, interpretations of law to matters of history, politics, and sociology, and more. For the Greek context is complex. There are special historical provisions for minorities in Western Thrace following the Treaty of Lausanne, but also for the Ionian and Dodecanese islands. The political and social influence of the Orthodox Church has been immense. Politicians usually tread warily in this area. We think of the controversies over the identity card issue almost two decades ago, when the government of Costa Sumitis sought to remove the stipulation, the requirements that Greek citizens indicate their religion on their identity card. Perhaps 90% of Greeks identify in some way with the Greek Orthodox Church. It is therefore recognized as the prevailing uh, religion. At the same time, the Article 13 of the Greek Constitution uh, recognizes uh, a plethora of different uh, rights and prohibits discrimination against other religions. It has, however, restricted rights, for example, to proselytize in terms of other faiths. And the influence of the Orthodox Church has been extensive, as in the delays in establishing a mosque in Athens. These are sensitive areas for many people. The nature of religious education in school, the right to uh, withdraw from that religious education in schools, the legal status of minorities and the, the possible exemption from Sharia law, the recognition of same-sex marriage. These, as I say, are sensitive matters. And it's also an area in which the European Courts of Human Rights in Strasbourg has uh, adjudicated uh, and has had quite a significant impact uh, in the Greek uh, case. Today we have two speakers who can guide us through the issues, the context and the outcomes. Yanis Siktakis is a judge of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. He has served as associate professor at the Democritus University of Thrace and previously as a professor at Bosphorus University in Istanbul. He is a lawyer at the Court of Cassation and at the Council of State. Uh, Yanis holds a PhD in law uh, from the University of Athens. We're delighted that he's able to join us. Alongside him is a, a long-term friend of the Hellenic Observatory. Effie Focus is Senior Research Fellow at the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy better known by its abbreviation LUMEP in Athens. And we're delighted that she continues as a research associate of the Hellenic Observatory here at the LSE. Effie's research has explored religion at the intersection with politics, law, and human rights, and in relation to nationalism and questions of European identity. Her publications include Religious America, Secular Europe, question mark. Islam in Europe, diversity, identity, and influence, and the European Court of Human Rights and Minority uh, Religions. So we have two expert speakers to guide us through this controversial, complex area. As always, we invite you, the audience, to send us your questions. And if you're following this on the Zoom um, facility, then you can see at the bottom of your screen, there's a QA and a icon. Uh, please send us your questions uh, through that means. If you're watching this uh, live on the Facebook um, page, 
then you can send us your questions through uh, the comment uh, facility. Do please send us your questions at any time. Uh, I'll do my best to uh, choreograph those and put those questions to our speakers. Uh, if you do send us your questions, can we ask that you indicate not only your name, but also your affiliation if you have one, and uh, perhaps in particular, tell us where you're, um, you're sending us your questions from. It's always good to have a sense of the spread of locations of our uh, audience. Above all, as your chair, can I ask you, if you are sending questions, to please keep them short. My task when it comes to the Q&A is not only to uh, uh, pose as many questions as I can, uh, but also to read them out on the screen on my right here. And uh, there's a time and place for academic articles. Uh, this is a time for short questions, if I may uh, ask you to do that. You can also send us your comments using Twitter. And the, uh, we suggest the hashtag for today's panel discussion is hashtag LSE Greece. And again, send us your comments at any stage uh, during the discussion, and we'll be delighted to, uh, to see those. The panel discussion today uh, is once again being uh, recorded and all being well, if there aren't any technical difficulties, we will be uploading the discussion as a podcast on the web pages of the LSE's Hellenic Observatory. Um, let me uh, then uh, say that we're going to start uh, firstly with Yale Siktakis and then Effie Fokas. I will pose some questions to both of them. I will then pick your questions from the audience uh, to give to them. And we look forward to uh, not only very informed discussions, but also uh, excellent questions from you, the uh, audience. So without further ado, can I pass you to our first speaker? Over to you, uh, Yanni, please. You'll need to unmute yourself, please. Uh, you're muted, I'm afraid. Thank Perfect. you, Kevin. Uh, good afternoon from uh, Strasbourg, and uh, thank you for uh, the invitation. Um, the third paragraph of Article 3 of the Greek uh, Constitution in force today reads as follows, I quote, the text of the Holy Scripture shall be maintained unaltered. Official translation of the text into any other form of language without prior approval by the Autocephalous Church of Greece and the Great Church of Christ in Constantinople is prohibited. End of quotation. This constitutional provision is unique. It is not found in any other European constitution. In fact, it is included in all Greek constitution since 1911. The occasion was the internal Greek battle over the Gospels in 1901. At the time, the Church of Greece and the Ecumenical Patriarchate reacted strongly to the translation of the Bible into the modern Greek Demotiki by a newspaper in Athens. In other words, an internal dogmatic issue of the state church, the language of the Bible, which arose 121 years ago, finds an immovable place in the Greek constitution to this day. I started with this reference to show how connected the state, the state church is to the Greek constitution. Let me take a less graphic but extremely important example. The Church of Greece, the state church, is characterized as autocephalous, that is self-governing. However, its jurisdiction covers not all, but half of the Greek territory. That is to say, the Greek constitution provides directly or indirectly for the following 
differentiations. Mount Athos in Chalkidiki and the dog canines are administered exclusively by the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople in Istanbul. Similarly, the semi-autonomous Church of Crete is under the direct jurisdiction again of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. The regions from Thessaly upwards are administered by the Church of Greece in Athens, belonging spiritually at the same time to the Ecumenical Patriarchate. What remains to be exclusively administered by the state church? Actually, the half Greek territory. I know that the monetization of religious communities is an internal matter for them. It is an aspect of their religious freedom. The Grand Chamber of the European Court in Strasbourg has emphasized this in the famous case of Hassan and Saul versus Bulgaria in 2000. The question, however, is what does the Greek constitution in the year 2022 have to do with these internal ecclesiastical divisions in the Orthodox state church? It is true that Greece is not the only country in Western Europe that has a state church. We also know that the role of the constitutional court in Western Europe is to resolve disputes, to adjudicate the disputes at the last stage and to guide the national administration and the national courts in one final legal direction. A crucial clarification at this point for our discussion. I say Western Europe because Greece, a member of the Council of Europe since 1949, and more importantly, of the European Union since 1981, can only be compared to Western Europe in terms of the protection of human rights, including religious freedom. I, know, I now return to the comparative figures. Other Western European countries have or have had a state church, Denmark, UK, Norway. In many countries in Western Europe, in Spain, in Austria or Italy, the respective constitutional courts adjudicate in principle overall the disputes that arise. An example is Spain, which is known to have had a concordat with the Holy See in the past. The Constitutional Court in Spain has resolved many ecclesiastical disputes, mainly over taxation, and these solutions have been confirmed by the Strasbourg Court. So what is the difference with Greece? The first difference, the Constitution, not only recognize the Church of Greece as a state church, but also regulates internal issues of that church. Undoubtedly, the issue of Holy Scripture is good for an academic example, but in practice it is forgotten today, 121 years after. But the issue of the jurisdiction of the Church of Greece on Greek territory and the kind of jurisdiction is mentioned, uh, I mentioned above, is still a matter of intense concern to this day for the believers, the Orthodox, the leaders of the church, the politicians, and the Council of State, the highest administrative court of the country, to which these disputes fall because the state Greek church is a public law entity. Greece doesn't have a constitutional court to which all disputes on religious freedom come and which gives comprehensive solutions in conformity with European law. It is a fact that in the past, the Council of State has exercised its jurisdiction in accordance with European law. However, the same has not been the case with the Court of Cassation, Arius Pados, 
whose decisions, judgments, have been persistently scrutinized by the Strasbourg court. Of the total of 70 Greek judgments of Strasbourg finding, finding violation of religious freedom, 16 concern contrary judgments of the court of cassation. So to summarize at this point, the Greek constitution not only recognizes the state church, but also regulates its internal issues. And yes, the Council of Strait has tried to adjudicate these internal issues through its case law, but the judicial solutions can only be temporary because new legal disputes are constantly arising. It is characteristic that the first Greek legal entity in history to file a case, an application before the European Court in Strasbourg was the Church of Greece. And it won because it was found that its property rights have been violated. This is the 1994 Holy Monasteries versus Greece judgment. To my knowledge, no other state church has to date applied before the European Court. I started my intervention with the largest religious community in Greece, the state church, not only because of its specificity within Western Europe. I started because it seriously affects the legal position of not Orthodox, that is, religious minorities in Greece. So now I turn to the legal status of minorities, and I will start with a snapshot here in Strasbourg. European Court of Human Rights, Human Rights Building, November 1992. Hearing of the first ever religious freedom case in Strasbourg. A Greek case, Kokinakis, Effie will, be, will analyze it uh, uh, on her intervention. The applicant is a veteran Jehovah witness from Crete. Who is appearing on behalf of the defending Greek government? A Greek judge. This is the first and last time today that a sitting national Supreme Court judge has appeared as governor, government counsel in Strasbourg court. On what legal basis is he arguing? I quote, the fact is that 95% of the Greek population belong to the Eastern Orthodox Church of Christ. So we are entitled to have our constitution reflect that." End of quotation. A broad majority is imposed on the minority by the constitution on religious freedom issues. This was the point of the uh, Council of the Government in 1992. Let's take one thing at a time. Religious minorities in Greece have different legal regimes. The Jewish community is a legal entity under public law, like the Church of Greece. The Muslim community has the status of a public decentralized agency and the Muslim religious foundations are under Ottoman law because that is where the International Treaty of Lausanne is involved. The Catholic community has only recently, in 2014, acquired a legal status, have been recognized as an ecclesiastical legal person. The Jehovah's Witnesses prefer the status of association and the Orthodox Christians who observe the Julian calendar for religious feasts are recognized as association or lastly, as ecclesiastical legal entities. In principle, is the different legal status of religious minorities a problem? No, according to Strasbourg case law. Is it a problem that some religious minorities have a stronger legal status than others? No, again, according to Strasbourg case law. States may entrust 
a selected religious community or two or three selected religious community with specific state faction. This is the Strasbourg case law. All of the above religious minorities have in the past applied before Strasbourg on one or more of legal issues. Again, EFI will, I think, uh, uh, refer to this case, Greek case law in detail. Are there any other religious groups that enjoy rights under Strasbourg case law? The answer is yes. The organs of the European Convention of Human Rights have explicitly or implicitly acknowledged that the safeguards of religious freedom under Article 9 of the Convention apply to A, the major or ancient world religions which have been existing for millennia or for several centuries, such as Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Taoism, B, to new or relatively new religions, such as Aumism of Mandarin, Mormonism, the real movement, Neopaganism, and C, to various coherent and sincerely held philosophical conviction, convictions, such as pacifism, veganism, opposition to abortion. Article 9 on religious freedom of the, on the Convention of Human Rights applies to the aforementioned beliefs and doctrines, regardless of whether a respondent state officially recognized them as religious. Nevertheless, according to Article 13 of the Greek Constitution, only known religions are subject of freedom of religion. The second important point, in my opinion, is the negative religious freedom. That is to say the freedom not to belong to a religion and not to practice it. That means that the state cannot require a person to conduct an act which might reasonably be seen as swear allegiance to a given religion. For instance, the European Court found that there had been a violation of Article 9 of the Convention of Religious Freedom as a result of a legal requirement on the applicants to take the oath on the Gospels on pay or of forfeiting their parliamentary seats. It's a San Marino case. The negative aspect of freedom to manifest one religious beliefs also means that individuals cannot be required to reveal their religious affiliation or beliefs. Kevin, you have already referred to the identity card uh, case before, uh, before uh, it was a Greek, uh, let's say, a dispute, but this case was also uh, examined by European Court in Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights found no violation of religious freedom at the time. State authorities are not free to interfere in individual freedom of conscience by asking them about their belief, religious beliefs or forcing them to express those beliefs. Moreover, such interference can be indirect according to Strasbourg law. For example, when an official document issued by the state has a religion box, leaving that box blank has a specific connotation. The court has also refused, the European court has also refused to recognize the need to mention religion in civil register or identity cards for demographic purpose, as what would necessarily involve legislation making it mandatory to declare one's religious belief. In general terms, in Western European countries, there are no longer serious violation of freedom to manifest religion, as was the case in the 90s and 2000 years. 
The most important case law is Greek. And EFI, again, I think we develop it today before the European Court, the claims about religious freedom are more issues of negative religious freedom as described above. And it follows that the purpose of the European Convention is religious tolerance, that is the neutrality of the European state. It is not without significance that the legitimate grounds for restricting religious freedom do not include the ground of national security. The omission is by no means accidental. On the contrary, the refusal by the drafters of the convention to include this specific ground in 1950 among the legitimate grounds of interference reflects the fundamental importance of religious pluralism as one of the foundation of a democratic society and of the fact that the state cannot dictate that a person, what a person believes or take coercive steps to make him change his beliefs. This is increasingly proclaimed by Strasbourg in its, in its judgment. There have been at least six relevant judgments of the Grand Chamber of the Court in the last decade. I quote from the last one, the court, has frequently emphasized that state's role as the neutral and the impartial organizer of the exercise of various religions, faiths, and beliefs, and has stated that this role is conducive to public order, religious harmony, and tolerance in a democratic society. End of quotation. The state's duty of neutrality and impartiality excludes any discretion on its part to determine whether religious beliefs or the means used to express such beliefs are legitimate. The case of Greece may be more complicated. This is because the issue of freedom of religion minorities is often approached by national courts as an issue of religious equality rather than freedom of conscience. In other words, the obligation of religious tolerance is disregarded, and the prevailing point is the following. If the Greek state can regulate internal matters of the state church or matters of state church education, then it is justified for the Greek state itself to regulate the same matters for religious minorities. This approach if it didn't one finds it in national case law, is not in line with the case law of the European Court, as summarized in a judgment of the Grand Chamber. I conclude, therefore, for the second part of my intervention. The shadow of the state church falls on religious minorities. They are no longer frequent intervention in the manifestation of religion but there are concerns about restrictions, restrictions and intervention in the internal affairs of religious minorities in their self-government right. In general, and this is my final conclusion, the Strasbourg Court case law in Western Europe has matured over the last decade. The aim today is to protect not so much believers as atheists, agnostics, skeptics, and the, and the unconcerned. This is why tolerance of religion is particularly important. I refer earlier to the Kokinakis hearing in Strasbourg on November 1992. The defending Greek government referred at the hearing more than four times in the, to the Norwegian constitution. The argument was simple. Norway has had a state church, the Lutheran church, since 1814, when it gained independence from Denmark. And the Norwegian king, continued the Greek government, has always been the head of this church. What bothers you that Greece has a state church 
and the president of the Greek Republic is sworn in, a, in at Holy Trinity was the argument raised by the Greek government. Norway revised its constitution in 2012, and there is no longer a state church. In 2017, Norway stopped paying from the state budget the clergy of the Lutheran church. This, despite the fact that some 79.2% of Norwegians were registered are members of the Church of Norway as of January 1st, 2010, two years before the constitutional revision. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Yanni, very much indeed. That's uh, very helpful and clear. Uh, framing of uh, how these issues are uh, seen at the European level and also how the those um, Greek cases have been um, framed at the European level as well. So uh, that's a very helpful um, overview uh, for us. There's a number of points uh, I'd like to pick up uh, later in the discussion, but let's turn to Effie and I think Effie is going to pursue more of the domestic dimension. Effie. Indeed. Um, first, let me thank you, though, Kevin, for this invitation. Uh, I miss the LSE, I miss the Hellenic Observatory, and it's a pleasure to be with you all, albeit uh, virtually for now. Um, and it's a pleasure also to share this space and an honor to share this space with my good friend Yanis. Um, so uh, we've been given uh, by Judge Tistakis a, a nice overview of the great significance of the European Court of Human Rights in terms of um, introducing change in the management of religious freedom uh, for all the member states of the Council of Europe. So my remit here indeed is to focus a bit more on the critical role that that court has played in the Greek context. But in fact, I'd like to start off uh, by focusing on the incredibly important role the Greek context has played for the development of that court's case law. And you both have hinted at this a little bit. Um, so let me just give a bit of a background to this, and we will end up as uh, the spoiler, I think, uh, indicated uh, in Kokinakis. Um, so the European Court of Human Rights was established in 1959, but it was not until 1993, after 34 years of its operation, that it first declared a state to be in violation of religious freedom, and that state was Greece. Religion was and continues to be a very sensitive issue for the court because it tends to be a sensitive issue for individual member states, as Kevin also said, sensitive areas for many people. And the legitimacy of the court relies to a large extent on the acceptance and implementation of its decisions by those member states. So whilst the court has been trailblazing the protection of fundamental freedoms as Yanis described to us, it has also had to balance its approach with an awareness of the degree of consensus that exists amongst member states on particular issues. Um, the consensus doctrine is a pretty complex uh, and fascinating uh, aspect of how the court works, and we could get into that in discussion time uh, with Judge Kistaki's help, if you like. Um, the point is, though, that in the court's early years, in particular on matters of a sensitive nature, which are often related to national identity, a religious freedom violation would have had to be rather blatant for the court to tread in those waters. So such a blatant violation came then in 1993 from Greece in the case of Minos Kokinakis, who is a Greek Jehovah's Witness living in Crete and who had been arrested over 60 times for the practice of proselytism. This time for the especially grievous crime of witnessing to the wife of a cantor in the Orthodox Church, the wife of something like a member of a choir for those who might not be so familiar. Um, Yanis made reference to this ban, but I want to note that this ban on the practice of proselytism was introduced into Greek law in 1938 under the Metaxas dictatorship, which spanned 1936 to 1941. So in company with lots of other beautiful uh, developments around fascism and everything in this time period, you understand uh, it's uh, striking that um, uh, a law from this period uh, applied still, and uh, we will get to its current day impact as well. So Kokinakis was vindicated in his claim, and after that, the floodgates were opened. Uh, seven more violations of religious freedom were found within the next seven years, notably all but one addressing the state of Greece. In fact, that one remaining one is the case you mentioned, Yanis, in San Marino about uh, religious oath. 
Um, until rather recently, Greece was responsible for over 20% of all European Court of Human Rights violations regarding religious freedoms. A striking number considering the court's jurisdiction over 47 countries across and beyond Europe. So it's in this sense that I say that Greece has been critical in the development of the court's case law on religion. And I think it's worth noting that it was in Kokinakis that the court developed what has gone down in history as its mantra um, on religious freedom, explaining that it protects both the freedom of religion, but also the freedom from religion. So it took this opportunity early on to say what we're protecting is not only belief, but freedom to not believe, as Yanis also indicated. So since the case of Kokinakis, the European Court of Human Rights has addressed a number of other problem points at the intersection between religion and human rights in the Greek context. And I want to refer to a few specific cases, five to be precise if you're counting, in order to tease out the underlying causes of some of these problem points and the challenges to addressing them. First, in Kanea Catholic Church versus Greece in 1997, a Catholic church in Kanya, Crete, appealed to the European Court of Human Rights because it did not enjoy legal status as a religious community and was thus unable to take legal proceedings to defend its property against a menacing neighbor at the time. In 2014, after a rather dramatic time lag of 17 years, the Greek state changed and significantly liberalized its policy on legal status for religious minorities, very much in the shadow of that case that had taken place 17 years earlier. So takeaway number one, it may take a long time for the impacts to take root. And this is reflective of the fundamentally conservative nature of the Greek state, which has been rather slow to make space for religious minorities in the Greek public sphere. The case of Mola Sali second is rather different in that the relevant policy change came just before the judgment was issued by the European Court of Human Rights and in anticipation of what was sure to be a negative judgment for Greece. Here, my esteemed co-speaker this afternoon, prior to his appointment as judge of the European Court of Human Rights with respect to Greece, defended the right of a Muslim minority woman living in Thrace, her right to not be subjected to Sharia law in the case of inheritance of her deceased husband's estate. The practice of Sharia law in Western Thrace and Greece, to which also Kevin referred earlier, is fundamentally embedded in a history of tense relations between Greece and Turkey, and the broader takeaway here is that limitations may well be rooted in causes that have actually little to nothing to do with religion per se. No one can make the serious argument that the Greek state allowed or enforced the practice of Sharia law in Greece because of a profound respect for this minority faith or for this particular Islamic tradition. That's not why this has been happening. Rather, it has to do with the Greek state leaning on the details of the 1923 population exchange, the Lausanne Treaty between Greece and Turkey, in order to prioritize and emphasize the Muslim over the Turkish identity of this minority community. Um, because it's the Turkish, not the Muslim dimension that especially sparks uh, Greek nationalism and, and uh, speaks to Greek nationalism. Third case. Same-sex civil union is another right one at the European Court of Human Rights for same-sex couples in Greece. And I raise this example in order to make the point that the intersection between religion and human rights should be defined rather broadly to include issues not only directly involving religion, because that's not uh, fundamentally a religious issue, um, but social and moral issues which may mobilize religious groups and individuals in opposition to the granting of a particular right. As was the case here, the Greek state faced formidable resistance from religious conservative factions uh, of, of the Greek public in its introduction of this particular right. Third, the case of Papagiorgiou versus Greece builds on a case mentioned, um, well, actually you didn't in the end mention the Yanis uh, Folgero versus Norway, a really significant uh, religious education uh, case managed by the European Court of Human Rights, um, where uh, the, the state of Norway had a mandatory religious education course, which it felt and was arguing that it was sufficiently critical, pluralistic, and neutral, but the claimants were act, uh, um, arguing that it was not the case. And uh, basically it was a, a, uh, an, um, a case built around this, this point. So in the case of Papa Yeyaryu versus Greece, we have two atheist families who sought to establish the right to freedom from religious education in Greek public schools, without though having to declare their religious belief or lack thereof to a state authority in order to win that right to exemption from religious education. 
From my perspective, this is an incredibly important and especially complex issue at the intersection between religion and human rights. Undoubtedly, a non-religious or anti-religious or a member a person or a member of a religious minority or even a majority religious person should not be obliged by the state to follow courses which communicate a truth claim about any particular faith. Also beyond doubt is that the state does not have the right to require declaration of one's religious orientation, as Yanis mentioned earlier, in order to allow exemption from a course. And one's religious orientation should never be revealed or even suggested by the contents of a student's diploma, as was the case until recently in the Greek context. But I would also argue that religious education, which is neutral in its approach and aims at educating citizen, uh, at educating students and young uh, and youth in a way that prepares them for life in a multi-religious society is an incredibly important resource and arguably could form the basis of a mandatory course uh, if managed well. But teaching about religion in a, com in a completely neutral, pluralistic and critical way is extremely difficult to achieve as we did see through that um, case of Norway uh, um, versus Fogero. Who is capable of teaching religion in this way, in a fully neutral, critical, and pluralistic manner? This question underpinned many Greek theologians' vehement opposition to efforts to introduce changes to Greek religious education, efforts to make it, in the spirit of Fulgero, uh, no, neutral, pluralistic, and critical, or at least as neutral, pluralistic, and critical as possible, given the aforementioned vehement opposition. So those efforts to pluralize Greek religious education materialized eventually in the form of new religious education school books, which had been in the making for several years and which the CDSAB government finally brought to use in Greek public schools in 2015. If I get the date exactly correct, I'm not fully sure, I don't remember, um, but I think 2015. Some of you in the audience may have followed that political drama around this particular issue, this decision that, that was taken. And some may also be aware that in a rather wild twist to this story, whilst the atheist families in the Papa Yiryu case were making their way to the European Court of Human Rights, a group of conservative Orthodox theologians, together with their unofficial spokesperson, uh, the Bishop of Piraeus, Serafim, successfully made the case before the Greek High Court that these changes to the Greek religious education are unconstitutional, specifically because, as Yanis mentioned, um, with reference to Article 16 of the Greek Constitution, that the Greek education is meant to, quote unquote, develop the religious conscience of youth. So the Greek High Court decides that development of religious conscience of youth must entail this very um, clear focus on orthodoxy and prioritization of orthodoxy. So we have a rather surreal situation of Greek religious education simultaneously being attacked from two directions, from those seeking freedom from religious education and those seeking the freedom to have an explicitly orthodox religious education. And in the aftermath, we have what I would describe as a lose-lose situation from my perspective. Uh, it represents a significant backtracking. We have the, the new, more neutral religious education books have been replaced with books aimed essentially to raise Orthodox children. That's what we have in school, uh, public schools today. And the solution to the problem of exemption has become to simply offer this right liberally to anyone who asks for it on the grounds of religious conscience. You don't have to say anymore what religion or minority religion you belong to. Um, but uh, it's not the case that an alternative course is necessarily offered or that the state requires that an alternative is offered. So the message communicated by the state initially, uh, I'd say essentially is orthodoxy or, or bust basically, orthodoxy or nothing. Uh, orthodoxy or you have no other option really. Um, I've said a lot about this particular case already, but I want to add one final takeaway. Um, besides the fact that in as neutral, critical and pluralistic as possible education about religion, is indeed a, a potentially valuable tool in educated, well-rounded, pluralist-minded students. I do believe that that's the case. Um, I also think that a certain, that certainly, sorry, that a certain degree of decoupling of orthodoxy and national education is an important step in decoupling religion and national identity. Neither can or perhaps should be fully achieved, but steps in that direction are, to my mind, a necessary precursor to a healthier separation of church and state. 
So before closing, I'd like to briefly bring us full circle with one more case and one more relevant takeaway. The case of Damavolitis versus Greece um, is currently be be uh, pending before the European Court of Human Rights. And it's a case about, guess what? <laughs> the same topic with which I opened my intervention, proselytism. So nearly 30 years after the Kokinakis case, where you think might, you might think you know, this issue has been solved, and after so much progress, if we can agree to call it that, in the field of religion-related rights in Greece, the state of Greece is again being called to defend itself before the European Court of Human Rights for violation of a person's right to witness his faith to someone of a different faith. The case begs the question of just how certain and safe are rights that have been achieved in this supranational court. Like the issue of religious education, the issue of the legal ban on proselytism in Greece is rather complicated. Um, as mentioned before, the Greek state's ban on proselytism was introduced into Greek law in 1938 under the Metaxas dictatorship. Now, back in 1993, when the European Court of Human Rights boldly for that time condemned the Greek state for violation of Kokinakis' religious freedom, it rather conspicuously and controversially did not condemn the Greek state's ban on proselytism itself. So in the Kokinakis case, Greece was reprimanded for its overzealous application of the ban, but it was not required to remove that, that ban from Greek legislation. Despite the fact that at that time, Greece was the only Council of Europe member state which criminalized proselytism. Now it's been joined by the state of Armenia, which joined the Council of Europe in 2002. Several years ago, I interviewed someone working at the Greek Obisman's office who deals with religious freedoms issues. And he indicated that, yes, it was not ideal that the proselytism ban remained intact following the Pokinaki's conviction. But at the same time, proselytism arrests were no longer a problem because he said, all police squad headquarters, I quote, have Kokinakis in the drawer. Not, of course, that they literally have a copy of the Kokinakis judgment in their desk drawers, but that they have received the message loud and clear in the aftermath of the Kokinakis judgment that they can no longer so liberally arrest anyone accused of proselytism. Now, I've also interviewed over the years several Jehovah's Witnesses who say, indeed, that's great, but wouldn't it be better and wouldn't they feel more secure if the proselytism ban had been removed from the Greek civil code altogether? I hear echoes now of these interviews in reading about the Damavolaitis case. It's difficult to pronounce. <laughs> this case, and I'll give you the details now, is a case of an, a non-Orthodox person, but also non-religious affiliated. He's not formally affiliated to any religious minority group. He's a farmer who had a conversation about religion with his farmer neighbor, um, which neighbor in turn had a conversation with the Pentecostal pastor and ended up converting to Pentecostalism. It was a public prosecutor in this case who took it upon himself to indict the Mavolitis on charges of proselytism, even though his former neighbor testified on his behalf that he'd not wrongfully tried to convict him to convince him to change from orthodoxy to Pentecostalism. He had not tried to convert him. So a final takeaway, human rights protection requires constant work and vigilance. One court case, no matter how high level and how authoritative the court, and no matter how revered as is the watershed case of Kokinakis, is not sufficient to resolve problems with deep roots. Here, I'll risk being a bit controversial, but I'll argue that like the French burqa ban, which was more about a message that the French state wanted to communicate rather than about a rapidly proliferating population of burqa wearing women threatening the French way of life, Similarly, the Greek proselytism ban represents a message which a possibly shrinking population of the Greek society wished to communicate, but a message which is kept in place by the banal but not benign links between religion and national identity in the Greek context. It's these strong links between religion and national identity in Greece, which suggests that it is within the rights of the Greek state to limit perceived threats to orthodoxy as represented in efforts to convert orthodox people to other faiths. I am intensely curious, I have to admit, as to what the European Court of Human Rights will say on this question, on whether it is indeed in 2022, nearly 30 years after the Kokinakis case, is it within the rights of the Greek state to protect orthodoxy from such perceived threats? And I regret to tell you, I think uh, Yanis probably can't uh, give us any insight into this because it's a case pending before the court, um, but hopefully it will become a point of discussion amongst us all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Effie, very much indeed. Uh, we have uh, 
explored quite a lot uh, now, both uh, European and domestic and the interconnections. So thank you both for making these things uh, clear and uh, providing uh, the platform for the discussion. Let me remind the audience, uh, please send us your questions using the Q&A facility on the bottom of your Zoom screen or using the comment facility if you're watching on uh, Facebook. I can see that there are a number of questions coming in and I'll uh, turn to those uh, in a moment. Let me start with a couple of questions of my own, uh, if I may, to both uh, speakers. And perhaps if I start uh, with um, with Yanis, um, you explained to us that uh, the European Court of uh, Human Rights uh, decided that uh, for Greece having a difference in the legal status of different religious organizations uh, was not a problem. Uh, and I think you mentioned this uh, ruling uh, beginning of the 1990s or, or uh, thereabouts. Um, I wonder if we were reviewing this in 2022, is that the most desirable stance for the European court to have uh, today? I suspect for some in our international audience, uh, that tolerance of a difference of legal status seems to be uh, a risky stimulus uh, to uh, conflicts over religious uh, rights and uh, human uh, civic rights. I wonder if you could, uh, if you feel comfortable uh, making a comment on that general proposition, uh, Yanni. Uh, you're on mute. Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, I, I, uh, I, can, I feel free to comment. I think that um, the case law of Strasbourg hasn't been changed all these years. Um, why? Because um, Strasbourg um, from the almost 100 cases, uh, 100 judgments, uh, which have been, uh, let's say, examined, scrutinized by the European Court of Human Rights, uh, and many of them concern uh, not exactly the legal status, but the um, refusal of registration of religious communities in different countries. The last years, there are many Russian cases about the refusal of registration oh. to, um, to religious minorities in Russia. Then uh, the court always said that um, uh, it's up to the religious um, group uh, minority to choose uh, the legal uh, form that it is, um, uh, let's say, very uh, friendly or very, um, it's, uh, um, it's the most convenient for uh, the purpose and the um, character of this religious community. Uh, it's not by chance, for example, that religious, uh, that Jehovah's Witness in all over Europe, they prefer the simplest legal uh, status, the one of the associations. And uh, this is the case in Greece, and this also was the case in Russia is the case in Russia. Then um, uh, the different legal status doesn't really um, um, pose a problem because first of all, it, the most of the time is, a, is a, a free choice of the, of the communities. And uh, as you can imagine, the religious uh, minorities do not like to have a public law uh, status like uh, the state church. They prefer less possible intervention by the state uh, to their status and to their uh, internal matters. And um, sometimes it happens, of course, that to, be, to have a refusal by the state authorities to recognize even the simplest legal form to the religious minority and this uh, was the case with the Russian case law. On the other hand, um, Strasbourg is very, um, um, let's say, sensible 
to the protection of the rights of the members of the religious minorities. Then uh, uh, examining uh, uh, the relevant claims of members of religious uh, minorities, uh, Strasbourg didn't, uh, doesn't uh, make any uh, distinction uh, between the legal status of the groups of the group where the member, the applicant, uh, belongs. Then I think that uh, this uh, distinction between uh, uh, several legal status for the rich minorities, but a very careful examination of the claims of the members of religious minority works well until today and in neither in uh, in any case there is no change of this approach about legal status of religious minorities all the last 30 years in Strasbourg in my, in my view thank you yanni i guess in the uk uh, there has been an ongoing debate uh, led in fact uh, in some respects by prince charles about the disestablishment of the Church of England. And this follows the disestablishment in the first part of the 20th century of the Church in Wales, for example, and the special provisions in Scotland. Uh, we could then have a situation within the next uh, decade uh, in which the number of European countries having state churches uh, reduces yet further, not not uh, Norway, as you explained to us, and perhaps soon not the UK. Uh, in other words, uh, if I followed you correctly, that would lead Denmark and Greece. Uh, and I wonder, I suppose academics uh, look for simplicity and patterns uh, too frequently, uh, but I wonder whether the, you feel that the, the special status that the Church of Greece has uh, under the constitution uh, and the geographical divisions uh, within uh, the church uh, with the patriarchate in, in Crete, uh, etc. Whether this complexity is something which is uh, more a problem than a friend. Uh, that is, that um, wouldn't it be simpler in the next decade or more uh, to also think uh, of the disestablishment of the Church of Greece? Well, um, this is a, this is a, a, I say, a question um, with historical and other um, uh, parameters, but I can say that uh, the current constitutional uh, position of uh, of the Orthodox Church in, uh, is, um, is a source of more problems than solution. And uh, I try to explain that this is problematic for, uh, uh, for the church itself now, because there are uh, more and more um, uh, application before the European Court of Human Rights coming from uh, the members of the church or the, of the state church. And uh, this, is, uh, this is very characteristic in my view. And uh, as uh, uh, in my um, information, there are also many um, cases pending before the Greek Council of State, which is the the administrative court responsible for the who has the competence about the state church because as I explained is a public law entity i cannot comment more but uh, i think that the, the numbers uh, uh, are very characteristic for this uh, for the complexity that uh, um, provokes this uh, status of state church uh, in, uh, in the Greek constitution. I don't think that uh, the next year will be so easy not to revise the relevant uh, articles. Thank you, Yanni. Uh, Effie, if I may, um, 
you covered uh, a number of cases uh, quite graphically in terms of uh, understanding the sensitivities of these uh, matters. Perhaps I could just quickly pick up two points, if I may. Um, you made the very powerful point that assumptions made uh, after the Kokinakis case in 1992, the decision of the European uh, Court, uh, have proved in recent times to be um, uh, not so valid or not so uh, strong, not so resolute, uh, etc. And uh, in particular, you uh, focused on the um, uh, restrictions on proselytism in the Greek uh, case. Uh, from what's been said, I suppose uh, historically in the last few decades, the, the European Court of Human Rights has kind of rescued uh, Greece from its uh, illiberal tendencies. Um, but you seem to be suggesting that at the moment, uh, Greeks might not look to the European Court of Human Rights in the same rescuing fashion, or is it more that uh, the stimulus is there, the problem is domestic? Yeah, no, I wouldn't say that, Kevin. Um, it, uh, Koikinakis is kind of an exceptional case in a sense. The, the judges were really divided on that decision. Yes. In three groups of three, really. And uh, there was a strong sense that um, it, it, will, it will come back to haunt us that we're not demanding a ban on this uh, proselytism ban, that we're not demanding that it be removed from the law books. Um, and uh, again, it was just as far as the court could go at that point in history, it already was a real uh, you know, trailblazer uh, in, in, in taking this decision. It had been avoiding, like the plague, religion cases until then. And so it took this on, but uh, tried to be mild in its approach it gave the conviction against the Greek state, but didn't require such a fundamental change. And um, so I, I would definitely, it is true that um, the, the court has uh, saved <laughs> Greece in many ways from, from itself uh, in the field of religious freedoms. And uh, I wouldn't say that it, it uh, has waned at all in importance. This is just an example of how important it is though that it, can, it takes the it takes the full measures sometimes when it does uh, it. But again, it's, it's a very difficult position the court is in because it has to balance um, this. Uh, it has to balance um, taking the right decisions on religious freedoms with making sure that uh, the member states are somehow ready and ready for some drastic changes. And, uh, and I don't want to undermine the, um, the freedom of the court. It's certainly judges, not that they're too constrained, but they are to a certain extent they, they need to take into consideration that consensus. Otherwise, indeed, yes. uh, the court's power will wane if member states just stop um, implementing decisions that it takes. Thanks very much. If I may, just one last question, Effie. Um, you mentioned the uh, question of uh, religious education in schools, and uh, we appreciate that this is still a live issue with uh, questions of the school curriculum. Um, and how children may um, exempt themselves uh, from such uh, education. Um, you've done great work on minorities in Greece. Uh, I guess this begs a, a large question, but I just invite you to give a brief comment. Uh, that what do you think the social costs are for, uh, within Greece for what some might see as uh, a lack of religious literacy, a lack of religious understanding of different faiths, if the focus is so much on we Greeks are orthodox and children uh, are facing a limited curriculum in terms of understanding other faiths, does that have wider social implications? Absolutely. Absolutely. Our children really, uh, Kevin, in every country, country across Europe uh, and in Greece, um, clearly are called to uh, um, live in a much more complex society than previous generations. And they are aware of, but not uh, sufficiently educated to understand the religious differences around them. Uh, even beyond that, though, Kevin, I do feel like some um, uh, tuition in the history of religion and understanding lots of aspects of religion that are critical to understanding art to understanding a lot of music to understanding uh, to developing well-rounded uh, um, citizens uh, uh, of the world and citizens in the future so um, 
I think it's uh, the social costs are great uh, in, in medium and long term uh, and in the long term. And I, th I just feel like it was a lost opportunity. Um, and I, I feel a bit, I intervened on behalf of my research group in that particular case um, to say that indeed I felt the state was uh, very much in the wrong uh, in the way that it was managing the religious exemption uh, issue. And that you know you, the state could never and should never demand uh, a, a confession of your religious belief or lack thereof. Um, and uh, at the same time, I think sometimes that could be perceived as a support of uh, the call for an end to religious education. And not at all, it, it shouldn't be this black or white. I, I think it really is important to keep aiming to this. Um, but as critical and as neutral and as pluralistic as possible religious education and somehow with the interventions that with the role played by the Greek high court in this case, what we've had instead is just giving up on that on that approach, at least in the short term and I think it's incredibly challenging for teachers to manage now teaching a course like this uh, to students who they know want something different, most of them want something different, want, most of them want, need something different as well. So yeah, this. I know that from uh, friends who are um, uh, religious education teachers in uh, Greek schools, I've heard similar comments. Let me go to the questions coming from the audience, and I'm going to try to take these uh, thematically. Uh, I wonder, Yanni, but also Effie, um, if you'd like to comment on a question which comes from Harold Emanuel, uh, which is actually directly related to the original decision in the Kokanakis uh, case. Effie has just mentioned about the split decision, but Harold asks as follows. Was the Greek judge uh, Baltikos on, in, on the European Court of Human Rights in the Kokanakis case right or wrong to dissent from the judgments of the courts? I don't know who wishes to comment on that. Looking back at this, at this in 2022, whatever it is, uh, three decades, um, would we say that if that case came again? Um, well, Harold's question is clear. Do you think uh, the dissent of the Greek judge was right or wrong then or now? I you can speak to it also from a personal level. Um, no. uh, the judgments are judgments of the court, are not individual judgment. And of course, uh, uh, I don't want to do any comment for uh, previous Greek judge. Um, just to say that it was very, uh, it was not very exceptional to have dissenting opinions uh, during the 90s or 2000 in any of the uh, Strasbourg court uh, judgments. A brief comment? I, I wish I, I, I wish I remember the details of the judgment. I would be more liberal in my critique. Uh, there are some really striking statements in that in that dissent, um, but I, I they, my memory doesn't serve me well enough to address them. Uh, yeah, I think um, there was a lot of room for critique of the of the decision of the final decision because indeed the the court should have ideally gone as far as banning uh, the uh, proselytism uh, uh, sorry bringing into that proselytism ban, but that there's not the reasons for the dissent. And so yes, I uh, found them rather problematic. Okay, thanks. We have uh, several questions, uh, which is to do with the establishments of uh, the church. Uh, and I guess we've touched on this already, but I wonder if you have any more comments to, to make in terms of the likelihood of such a debate uh, gaining ground in the, in the Greek case. Uh, Effie, do you want to give us a guide on that? Is whether in the next 10 years, is this going to be a stronger issue than it much stronger issue than it is today yeah uh, it's really hard to predict uh, kevin i was laughing when you asked this question earlier to yannis because it's like he was preaching to the choir he's really devoted a lot of his career prior to um being based in strasbourg dealing with uh church state relations um and uh I mean, you brought up the example of the identity card issue and it's it's uh, probably the most um powerful example we have uh in the recent past of how difficult it is for the state 
for a government to get very far in this direction. Uh, indeed, uh, Sumitis decided and removed the reference to religion from the national identity cards, and that hasn't changed. Although you see lots of Greeks uh, have put their identity cards in this little uh, frame that says, I am Orthodox, I am Orthodox all around it. <laughs> so they find different ways to kind of communicate that still on their identity cards. But um, but that came at a big loss for the government. Um, first of all, the fact that the church had organized uh, a protest and started gathering signatures, over 3 million signatures were gathered, I know, one third, one third of the population um, to call for a referendum on the issue. That was a powerful message communicated by the church and it was heard by politicians. And in this aftermath, you saw politicians doing things like seeking you know, the blessing of the archbishop on political issues that had nothing to do with religion. Um, and uh, you know, being very open and, uh, and public about uh, getting their blessings, ahead, getting the church's blessings ahead of the next elections. Um, in which the, the, that party had suffered significantly. So uh, it comes at a, at a major cost. And, I, and it, for me, it keeps coming back to that point of the relationship between religion and national identity. As long as the church can, or other conservative factors in society, and I don't want to just blame the church in this. I mean, it's certainly not a monolith. Um, and, uh, and I wouldn't uh, say that you know, the archbishop himself is uh, clearly implicated in this, but there are many conservative dimensions of the church that. Uh, manage to mobilize people in nationalistic ways, to manage to mobilize them on that relationship between religion and national identity that must be maintained. And, uh, and if, if the education system doesn't change how it treats this relationship, I think that uh, it's very difficult for uh, a separation of church and state um, along the lines that you're talking about disestablishment of the church to take place in any kind of smooth manner. And so for me, uh, it really all starts in what's taught in schools and not only in the religious education course, but also in the history courses. And that, um, that, that's really a difficult matter to manage. Thanks, Secretary. Um, I'm gonna take the opportunity to um, jump to a question from my colleague at the LSC, Jim Walters, who is the um, director of the LSC Faith Center. I'll read directly. Uh, his question, uh, Effie, is actually taking up your last comment, but he's looking uh, to have a guide in terms of um, um, how much might be changing culturally. Uh, he says, we often think of the promotion of religious pluralism as simply a legal matter, but where might the culture be changing within Greek society? Is it in schools uh, or collaborative responses to the refugee crisis? I know that different religious organizations, organizations of di different religious faiths, are very active in terms of the refugee crisis in Greece, uh, or perhaps in sections of the church itself that are working to promote interfaith uh, understanding. And again, we've hosted previous speakers in our Hellenic Observatory uh, public events program, which indicates uh, a diversity of views within, uh, within the uh, church in terms of interfaith uh, understanding. So I wonder what your response to Jim would be uh, if we were looking for evidence of cultural change on these matters, where might we find that evidence, uh, most likely to find the evidence, Effie? It's a, it's a very good and difficult question. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm fully qualified to answer. I don't know that I have a, a, a pulse on this in the Greek context, although I probably should. I've been based here for enough years now. Um, but it's, uh, I, I feel like the, the schools until this change back to, um, uh, to a very conservative approach to religious education were a, a very good source for potential change in this regard. Uh, the way that the previous books that had been introduced by chance or maybe, but uh, in any case under the CDSAC government really were excellent um, and they were very open and, uh, um, and uh, making children think in a much broader way. Indeed, uh, the engagement of, um, I don't know, there, there are developments in different directions. Yes, the church has always been uh, incredibly uh, active in the field of welfare provision and care for, um, for uh, people, especially experiencing the financial crisis. Um, or under the refugee crisis, and you see positive developments in the church on that front. And then you see 
uh, things like uh, all the debates around the limitations around COVID on the church. And you know, people have been really negative uh, seeing the church have freedoms that maybe shops or restaurants, et cetera, did not have. And uh, all of that um, has uh, bred a, a pretty intense negativity towards the church as well. So you, um, I, I can't, I'm really sorry, <laughs> um, Dr. Walters, that I can't, uh, I, I think I can't give um, a clear sense of the direction that we're taking. I, I find um, a lot of developments in, in, in different directions, but I will echo what Yanni said about uh, what the court is seeing. The court is seeing that it's having to defend much more, not religious minorities, but uh, a, free, a desire for freedom from religion, atheists, mm -hmm. non-affiliated, etc. Uh, we hear those voices much more powerfully in the Greek context, increasingly so, um, and uh, and I think that um, that uh, it's a it's a force to be reckoned with, and uh, that is um, that you feel this in society much more. Uh, they just okay, we're moving on <laughs> from this aspect of Greek identity and uh, and embracing something different, um, but I can't put numbers to this. Okay, uh, appreciated. Yanni, I wonder if uh, I can pose this question to you uh, from uh, Kiregatsu Katsuyani, a colleague, a uh, postdoctoral fellow in our European Institute. And she asks, is it compatible with a respect for human rights that a significant part of an EU member state's territory, which moreover receives domestic and EU taxpayers' money to be closed to women, uh, she's referring, of course, to Mount Athos. And I wonder if, uh, could you imagine uh, a case coming to the European Court of Human Rights uh, on this uh, issue that's uh, a part of a territory which receives both national and EU funding? Uh, is there a, a scope for appeal on that as, as, as an infringement of human rights? Why can't 50% of the population uh, visit monasteries on Mount Athos? Um, I don't want to comment on this. <laughs> um, just I want to say that there is a constitutional provision about this ban to Mount Athos, an old constitutional provision, and also that there is a uh, a special um, provision uh, to the treaty of uh, 1981 when Greece um, joined uh, the European Economic Community at the time and then all the um, relevant uh, treaties with the European Union, they provide a special status because there is one of the four basic uh, uh, European freedoms is also the, the freedom of circulation between the different parts of the territories of the member states. Um, then um, I just don't want to comment. I just I don't want to comment, but just to emphasize that there is both a constitutional provision for this band and also there is a special provision to the European treaties uh, about this band. Yes, that's uh, well taken, uh, Yanni, and I think it connects with a question from Michael Roberts uh, here. Uh, Michael Roberts uh, has previously worked in the British embassies in Athens and Ankara. And uh, he says that the standoff between Greece and Turkey on the rights of their respective minorities in the other country is a stain on Europe's human rights record. The fact that this dispute is so often dressed up in religious clothes, uh, for example, the question of the muftis of Komotini and Xanthi, only makes this worse. Does the European court feel inclined or able to step in to help clean up this mess? So I would interpret this uh, question, Yanni, as being uh, your previous answer is, of course, absolutely correct. Uh, the status of Mount Athos is sanctified in terms of international treaties, uh, special historical circumstances, uh, etc. Uh, but I guess Michael Roberts's question is saying that in 2022, when we consider questions of uh, religious freedom and human rights, 
whether the recourse to explain matters through treaties and history is actually very helpful uh, today, uh, rather that it might make things things worse. Um, I wonder whether you you would like to comment on that, whether uh, this baggage, this legacy is actually um, helpful today or whether it's being uh, used opportunistically by governments to reinterpret the issues beyond matters of religious rights into questions of um, uh, uh, history and treaties. I just want to say that uh, uh, any individual is uh, free to lodge uh, an application before the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, this is the, I think, the great idea before the European Congress of Human Rights uh, ratified, uh, signed, ratified 1950. Then uh, the court uh, is always based in Strasbourg, uh, and if there are relevant uh, application, the court is obliged to uh, interpret and apply Article 9 of the European Convention of Human Rights about religious freedom. We are not, um, the mission of the court is not to be United Nations or something different. It's a court uh, and uh, its competence uh, starts when there is a, an individual or interstate application lodged before um, the court. Mm. Okay, thank you. I wonder on a broader question, uh, I think Effie touched on the question of uh, same-sex union, and I noticed her description of same-sex union. Uh, if there was a case uh, that came to the European Court uh, now about the right to be married, to have marriage status uh, in Greece between uh, a same-sex uh, couple, uh, do you think the European Court would um, support such a, an appeal? Effie, do you want to go first? Well, I, I, I think again, it's probably better qualified, but I'm fairly sure it already has come to the court, not from Greece, though, from another state, and the court did not deem that, it, um, that a right to uh, marriage specifically um, exists, that, that it needs to defend such a right, basically, um, that uh, it did not convict a state that was not allowing uh, marriage. Um, as long as you have access to the same uh, legal and economic, et cetera, dimensions of uh, the rights that marriage uh, offers you, that I think, I think, I, I wish I could remember the case, but um, that it's seen as a, it's a cultural dimension and what is defined into it is not a matter of uh, law that the court needs to defend. The court makes sure that you have equality before uh, the state on this issue, and so the state needs to offer you the same uh, um, treatment in terms of the legal, economic, et cetera, dimensions. But the cultural aspect and the social uh, conception of marriage may vary from one country to another, so I don't think, I'm fairly sure that, uh, of course, already decided that case. So. Um, that's not to say, though, that that uh, perspective wouldn't change. And we have seen certainly the, um, you know, the the court is called the European Court of Human Rights. It's called a living. Uh, it's it's um, defending a living convention. I remember the exact terminology again. I can tell us, but obviously, its uh, its perspective changes over time. And something that might have been too conservative in the past may uh, change uh, in the future. And maybe it would be. Okay. It would bring the case for the poor. Who knows. Okay, just before uh, um, I invite uh, Yanis to uh, comment, when Effie, Effie was making that comment, I was uh, recalling the history of the United States Supreme Court in the 1950s. And in a classic phrase, they overturned the separate but equal provision. That is that although states in the South might uh, claim that uh, equal legal rights were being given, the social and cultural uh, context was different. And uh, the US Supreme Court, the Warren Court, declared famously, separate can never be equal. Is that relevant to the question of civil union as opposed to marriage in the Greek case from the perspective of the European courts, uh, Yanni, do you think? 
Um, I, I cannot uh, uh, make. Uh, <laughs> um, I cannot comment on this because there is a, a relevant petty case. I just uh, want to say that um, 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 you can have a look to the Valenatos case, which is a case of the Crown Chamber. Valenatos case uh, versus Greece, which is a case of the um, Grand Chamber here in Strasbourg, and uh, this concerns also the uh, same-sex uh, civil uh, uh, unions. And uh, I think that uh, the court has uh, a specific reasoning in this Grand Chamber judgment, and everyone can have access to this judgment, read it, and uh, has uh, uh, his own conclusion about this. Thank you, Janet. I appreciate that answer uh, very well taken. Uh, you're here to help guide us and give us information of where to look for knowledge and then uh, come to our interpretation. Uh, we have come to an end, uh, to the end for this uh, discussion. Before I thank our speakers, uh, let me thank our audience for keeping with us and sending me uh, your questions. Um, let me also mention uh, that uh, our next Hellenic Observatory event uh, will be on Monday the 7th of February uh, at uh, 1800 UK time, uh, 8pm uh, in Greece. And uh, we're delighted to be hosting Professor Dimitris Giovas, a Professor of Modern Greek Studies from the University of Birmingham. And he will be speaking about his new book, Greece from Hunter to Crisis. Modernization, Transition, Diversity. And uh, uh, we're also very pleased that alongside Professor Jovas, we have two distinguished uh, discussants. Um, Professor Thalia Dragonas, uh, Professor Emerita of Social Psychology at the National and Capodistrian University of Athens, and Staphis Kalibas, Gladstone Professor of Government at the University of Oxford. So do join us for that next event, Monday the 7th of February uh, at six o'clock in the UK, 8 p.m. Uh, in Greece. And um, we look forward to uh, that discussion. Let me also uh, remind the audience that this discussion uh, will be available, we hope, as a podcast on the websites of the LSE's Hellenic Observatory. And uh, do please, um, uh, take advantage of that and uh, mention it to your uh, friends. Um, so uh, let me uh, thank our speakers very much indeed, both uh, Effie Forkas and Yannick Siktakis uh, for their contributions. And uh, I think it's been a very informative and helpful uh, discussion. So until our next events, uh, thank you for watching. Good night. <laughs>